Hello, welcome to Pratyancha. You're watching this video on my channel called Pratyancha. My name is Neha and today we shall be discussing a wonderful piece by John Keats, a romantic piece entitled Ode to the Nightingale. I will recite the piece for you and we shall understand it stanza by stanza, line by line. So let's hear from John Keats what he has to tell us in the Ode to the Nightingale. Ode to a Nightingale, John Keats. John Keats is a romantic poet and uh, very tragically he died young from tuberculosis. His time period is 1795 to 1821, barely 25 years old and uh, he passed away. In this piece, he praises the nightingale and praises her in beautiful words, in imagery that excites us to perhaps hear the song of the nightingale in the woods, go and experience it for our own selves. And like we have always seen in the romantic playlist, we have talked about it many times, an ode is where a poet expresses his deep respect, his deep admiration and his deep love for the subject. So here, this is what Keats is doing when he speaks to the nightingale. Nightingale belongs to the thrush family of birds and they have a beautiful song which is a part of a mating ritual. They sing to attract a mate and this is the song that Keats is referring to in his uh, piece or to a nightingale. Keats uh, wrote many other pieces uh, in the romantic genre of poetry and I would suggest that you must go and check the romantic playlist on the Pratyancha channel. You would find a lot of other things that would interest you in that playlist. So let's begin reading John Keats. He starts, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains. My sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed and lithewards had sunk. What he's wanting to say here that when I listen to the nightingale's song, there is an ache in my heart and there is a certain numbness about it. It is almost that I start to feel drowsy and I start to feel that I'm motionless. There is a numbness about me and it seems like I have drunk hemlock. Now hemlock is a poisonous drug which is uh, made from the plant of the same name, hemlock, and he feels that uh, this is something that he has drunk and he's starting to feel drowsy. And he also says that it also feels like I've had something with opium in it. Opium also is a drug and it is sometimes taken to relieve severe pain. And he feels that this is what uh, is happening to me when I listen to the nightingale's song. And then he mentions uh, there is in this piece of poetry, there are a lot of mentions to Greek mythology. So he starts with his mention here and he says that I feel that one minute into listening to this song and I had sunk Lithe words. Lithe is a river in Greek mythology and it is believed that if you drink the water from that river, you actually forget everything that you have remembered till that date. Basically, your memory is wiped clean. So he feels this is the kind of, uh, of surge of emotion that I feel within myself, the surge of uh, sensation that I feel within myself, that I feel drowsy, I feel that I'm forgetting things and I feel that I have slowed down. There is a general numbness about me. It's not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness. Very beautifully, he says that it's not like I'm jealous of you or that I envy you for producing such music from your throat that I feel this way, but it is because I am over drunk on happiness. It is your happiness that is exciting this state in me. I'm over drunk on it and I'm way too happy in this, in this uh, happiness that your song is engendering for me. That thou, light wind dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full throated ease. And now he calls the nightingale a light winged dryad. Dryad again a reference to Greek mythology is a nymph. Basically um, it's a female form imagined as a soul that lives on trees and it's a very lithe sort of a form and he also imagines that it has wings because it's a bird that he's talking to 
too. So you see the tone of the ode. It seems like John Keats is conversing with the nightingale, talking to her as if the nightingale is sitting in front of the poet and they are having a conversation and Keats is showering praises on her. So he tells her that I feel that you are this nymph or this uh, fairy-like creature, a female form uh, with wings who lives on these trees and in some melodious plot, wherever she sings, that plot turns melodious and he says it's of beech and wood. A reference is to beech trees but it is to say that it's a forest and it's very thickly uh, populated with trees and there are shadows numberless. So there are too many trees and there are shadows of the leaves, of the branches, of the foliage and this is the kind of uh, forest in which a nightingale lives in a very thick dense forest and I only hear your voice and you are singing of summer in full throated ease and he says that the way the nightingale sings it seems like summer is around the corner and she's celebrating the onset of this season. Uh, in this entire piece there'll be a reference to summer, there'll be a reference to the fact that someone from very cold regions is writing this poem so they await summer. They um, look forward to this season. It's not in the tropics where the summers are very extremely hot but it's it's a very cold region where Keats is writing in and therefore summer is a very welcome season. You can be out, you can be out in the sun, the colors are beautiful and uh, you can have a lot of activity outdoors which is prohibited in the much colder season. So therefore he says that when I listen to the song of the nightingale I feel that the wonderful season of summer is upon us. Let's look at the next stanza now. Oh, for a draught of vintage that had been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provençal song and sunburnt mirth. What beautiful imagery he creates here and with a lot of metaphor thrown in, he compares the nightingale's song to wine of great vintage and he says you're like this draft of vintage and usually um, when you serve wine from a bottle or from a small cask then it's not called a draft but when you serve it from a huge container in which it has been stored and he also refers to the storage he says that it seems like this wine was stored in the deep cool earth a reference to uh, like the cellars or the storage uh, of wine which is under the earth uh, which is in the basement so that the wine gets a colder climate for it to mature and he talks of this storage because he says that you have cooled a long age in the deep delved earth so you like this wine of a wonderful vintage vintage wine which is produced from grapes in a single season and uh, you really taste as wonderful you smell as wonderful and it looks like you've been aged well in the cool earth and you also taste of the flora and fauna of the region you know wines from uh, various regions are respected are sought after because they taste of uh, they have a very particular taste which belongs to the ecology of that particular region and you are also like this you carry within yourself the fact that you are uh, you stay or you belong to a certain ecological niche and I can hear the contents when you sing uh, of this niche in your voice and you also because it's so magically beautiful your song I think of dance I think of Provençal song and uh, Provençal was this is this uh, former province in uh, southeast France on the coast of the Mediterranean and he's thinking of these um, beautiful places uh, and he says sun burnt mirth this is where the sun is wonderful you go to these places to sun your yourself to escape the cold and depressing climate of the regions that he's living in and he speaks that this is how your song is because it reminds me of all things beautiful he started with the summer then he calls her a draft of, of vintage wine and then he speaks of dance and Provençal song and of sunburnt mirth mirth is great happiness joy so this is what your song means to me he says ahead in the stanza Full of the true, the blushful hypocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Again, he makes a reference to Greek mythology. Hypocrine is a spring which they imagine is uh, on a mountain and it is sacred to the, to the muses. So poets feel that if they drink of that spring, then they can really produce uh, great poetry. 
So also uh, here, when he says that it is blushful, he's referring perhaps to again the color of wine. And then he says uh, purple stained mouth. So I'll get drunk on it and my mouth will be stained purple or basically a reference to a very dark red wine. And this is how I feel you are. You are that spring of, of uh, hypocrine. And I can uh, see that if I drink at you or basically I take in your music, poetry from me would flow even more wonderfully than it is doing now. And there's a lovely line in here which says when it talks about this, the spring with beaded bubbles winking at the brim. So this is like if a fountain or a spring is just springing forth, you tend to see a lot of water that bubbles around the rim. And he's referring to that, that these are beads that seem like a necklace around the, around the spring and they're winking. So it's a lovely word to use here that sometimes the light reflects off them. At other times you see them whole and therefore the bubble seems to wink at you. And this is how the spring of Hippocrene is. And I imagine that you are full of the waters from this, from this spring. And I might drink of these waters and leave the world unseen. And I would just be gone with you into the deep wood. When I listen to your voice, I just want to belong to the languorous, melodious nature of it. And I want to drown in it and live with you and go into the deep wood and fade away into, into that wood, away from the life that I have been leading. So this is what he says in this stanza and like I said it's very rich on on the metaphors of wine of something which is cooled in the heart of the earth of the spring hippocrene and of uh, Provençal and the song and dance and great joy so this is how many things the nightingale song is to Keats let's look at the third stanza of the poem He continues that when I say I want to fade away with you in the forest. So he continues from this theme and he takes it with the first line of the third stanza as well. Fade far away, dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves has never known. The weariness, the fever and the fret. Here where men sit and hear each other groan. Where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs. Where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. Where but to think is to be full of of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Keats here decides to talk about all the pains, the sorrows, the tensions that human life goes through. And therefore, he tells the nightingale that I want to go with you and fade away and dissolve and quite forget. And I want to forget these things, things which you have never known. He tells the nightingale that what thou amongst the leaves has never known, among the trees, among the leaves where you live, you don't know of these things. And then he names them. You know, human beings get tired, they're weary, the fever, they get, they fall ill, they fret, they worry about things. And then where they sit and they groan, they complain about the problems in their life and they suffer from say cerebral palsy or other diseases which do not even allow them to retain their balance and they grow old so the last grey hairs are being shaken with the illness that they are suffering from where youth doesn't remain forever but it grows pale and it grows very thin and it dies it becomes spectre thin like a ghost an old man starts to look like when his youth has left him or and then you also do not know what is it to think of all the sorrow and the despairs that we live with. Late night, basically, you are under so much of hopelessness that your eyes lack the spark or the spirit. They feel very heavy. They feel like as if they just want to keep themselves shut. And beauty, beauty cannot hold her own but goes away or fades away in time. She cannot hold the lustrous eyes. And those who fall in love with these beautiful eyes, they also do it for a day or two or for a short interval of time. And soon enough, they figure out that that beauty has faded away. So you do not know these problems, these tensions, these uh, the burden of mortality that humankind lives with and I would also want to walk away from all this with your song. So let's now look at the fourth stanza of the of the piece and uh, he again starts to speak of how he would want to go away with the nightingale. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by not charioted by Bacchus and his paths, but on the viewless wings of poesy, through the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her 
her throne, clustered around by all her starry face. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. He says, I'll away and away, fly with you. I just want to leave this world and come with you. And no, I'm not going to be charioted by the god of wine. Bacchus, again, a reference to Greek mythology. It's the Greek god of wine. And he has uh, his entourage with him, his friends and his aides who come with him. So I don't need Bacchus and his parts. Basically, I don't need the Greek god of wine. I don't need wine to drown myself. I can listen to your song and lose myself in the wonderful intoxication. And I will come with you on the viewless wings of poesy. Poesy, poetry, music, beautiful things that lift your soul. So he says, I'll come with the wings of poetry and these are viewless wings. You can't see them tangibly. And I'll come through the dull brain perplexes and the retards. You know, I'll leave behind all these worries that human beings have, all the complexities that they live with, all the confusions that they have. Because with you, the night is very tender. It's beautiful with the moon shining and it's the queen moon and she has her face or her fairies like uh, the queen is sitting and the fairies are surrounding her similarly the moon is sitting on the throne and the stars are surrounding the moon in the night sky but where you are nightingale there is no light there and why does he say that because the nightingale belongs to a very dark and thick forest she is a bird of the woods you perhaps can't see her but you can hear her and uh, he says that you belong to this place but there's no light and a little bit of light is taken with the breezes when they come within this, this forest which is thickly, thickly green and uh, it's, um, it's somewhere where the light cannot penetrate very easily. So while I can see the night sky, it's tender with you, I can listen to the music that you're producing in the night sky but where you are there is no light it's a thick dark dense forest with its winding mossy ways there is moss on the pathways of the forest and they're winding they're not straight and this is where you live in that deep dark mysterious wood now that we are halfway through the piece, let's have a quick recap of what Keats is talking about here so he starts the piece by saying that it's the most intoxicating thing that he has come across when he listens to the Nightingale's song to an extent that he mentions opium and then he mentions the hemlock which is almost poison. So from intoxication he's taking it to an extreme degree of something which is poisonous and therefore uh, completely takes you into its fold and takes hold of your senses and your reasoning and then he goes on to compare the Nightingale's song to vintage wine to a spring in heaven where the muses reside and therefore it's a uh, it's panacea for the poet if he were to drink on that spring then poetry would just flow from him and this is what he calls the nightingale's song and then he also says that you know with your song I really feel that I can fly on the wings of poetry just flow with you come with you and leave all the earthly cares behind leave all that is not right with the world which is painful which is stressful which causes uh, human beings to fret and think about illness and death and mortality I can leave all that behind and just come with you flow with the song and lose myself within it in the deep dark wood where you live and then he says that right now when I'm listening to your song I cannot see what flowers are at my feet nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass the thicket and the fruit tree wild white hawthorn and the pastoral egalantine fast fading violets covered up in leaves and mid may's eldest child the coming musk rose full of dewy wine the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves in this stanza, once again, Keats refers to the fact that we cannot see you. We can only listen to your song because you're lost deep into the woods somewhere. And it's not only the song of the nightingale which is intoxicating, but Keats is also setting up a stage of a deep, dark, thickly uh, forested place where... Uh, 
even the light of the heavens cannot penetrate much but it just goes with the breezes and in this deep dark mysterious place with winding pathways nightingale you exist and it is a place where there's darkness so i can't see what flowers are at my feet i can't even see the see the flowers on the boughs so it's a branch of a tree the main branch of bough and it has some flowers and here the reference to flowers is made in the words soft incense incense something which has fragrance and soft flowers are soft so the soft fragrance basically the flowers which are on the trees i can't even see them but i imagine that okay this is the season so this must be the flower it's not my eye guiding me but the fragrance that i that i uh, experience in the woods and the fact that i know that this is the season so this must be the flower and then he says that uh, the season endows the grass and the thicket and the fruit tree with such with such flowers and he mentions some flowers here the white hawthorn the pastoral eglantine the fast fading violets covered up in leaves so he mentions the violets the eglantine and then the roses so i can maybe not see them but i can imagine these are there and the roses on a dewy wine there are a lot of dew drops on that on that particular uh, shrub and the murmurous haunt of flies i can hear the noise of the flies like on a summer evening and i hear you beautifully so in this stanza like half way through the poem in the fifth stanza keats set up sets up a stage you know like a, a person setting up the stage in a film or in a play where the heroine nightingale is now singing so to give you an impression of how beautiful the nightingale song is the poet also decides to tell you what he experiences when he walks into a wood and listens to the nightingale thereby setting the entire uh, context for you within which the song should be heard or within which the song is heard in nature let's look at the next stanza now darkling i listen and for many a time i have been half in love with these full death called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath no more than ever seems it rich to die to seize upon the midnight with no pain while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy still wouldst thou sing and i have ears in vain to thy high requiem become a sod now this is an extremely important stanza to write the poet feels that the song is so intoxicating that to an extent it can lead him to believe that perhaps there is no joy left in life this is what i should sing and i should simply drown in it so there is a notion here up till now there was wine there was summer there was dance he was talking about happiness now comes a notion where the poet also feels that this sort of languorous song which the nightingale sings can make you feel so intoxicated it can make you feel sometimes very dull and depressed as well because he starts to speak of death here and the first word of the stanza is darkling so like i said it's a conversation between the poet and the nightingale so the poet addresses the nightingale as darkling because it's the it's a night bird it's singing through these dark woods and he refers to her as the darkling not the darling but the darkling and then he says that i listening to your song i've been half in love with death you know i start to speak to death in soft voices and in my quiet breath i quietly call uh, him names the death names and i also speak about it in my poetry you know in many a mused rhyme you know i create poetry with the theme of death and it seems when i listen to your song it seems rich to die to drown away in this music and you know what this will be a painless death i'll stop upon the midnight there'll be no pain i'll just go with you and you shall simply keep singing and i would be dead i would have years in vain because i'm dead so i can no longer hear you and he says that it is the requiem that you will sing this beautiful song that you are really singing will and requiem is actually a mass for the dead and he says you would still be singing for me so your song will now become this prayer for the dead that you're offering but i shall be like a sod basically sod is where the ground where the grass grows and i shall become like that i will no longer be able to listen to you but this is how it seems rich to die with you so i think he changes the tone by the time he comes to the sixth stanza he's now waking up and he realizes that this intoxication perhaps needs to be paused at a certain point and one needs to withdraw from that because he's starting to think of death very um 
fancifully he's starting to write poetry which has death as the theme and then he goes on to say in the next stanza thou wast not born for death immortal bird no hungry generations tread thee down the voice i hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown perhaps the self same song that found the path through the sad heart of ruth when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn that the same that oft times had charmed magic casements opening up on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn so now he says, I do start thinking of death, Nightingale, but let me tell you, you do not know what death is. You have lived through the centuries and he almost calls her immortal, that you have existed through the centuries and all generations have heard your song and no hungry generations have tread thee down. Human beings have not been able to cause your extinction. Perhaps this is what he wants to say here. You've always been around. And what I hear today was heard by kings and emperors and their clowns in the times gone by. And it was the song which perhaps Ruth heard also. This is a reference to a mythological story. Ruth marries a man who is from another land and not from her country. And she goes with him to where he stays. But then he dies soon after and Ruth therefore is amidst a field of alien corn. She decides to stay back, help her mother-in-law do the farming and she's very sad because the husband is dead. The corn is alien because this is not her land and also she's sick for home. Basically she misses her home as well. So the poet is saying that perhaps Ruth also heard your song from the mythological story and this is the same song that perhaps uh, now he is thinking in terms of a fairy land you know in fairy stories or in fantasy stories a song can perhaps open the doors to something open the windows to something so casement is um, referred to here perhaps it's a casket or some kind of a box and perhaps it's the window of a sea vessel and that opens so the notion the metaphor here is the doors open to things unseen unheard of not imagined with your song so you are immortal you sing these songs and you wonderfully can open some doors to magic lands. So these two stanzas relate in this way that at one point he realizes the intoxicating depth of the song and in the other he realizes that the bird is immortal and her song or her voice really has this magic upon him it can play like a magic wand upon anyone's consciousness. Now we'll move to the last stanza of the piece. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul's self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she's famed to do deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows over the still stream, up the hillside and now it's buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music, do I wake or sleep? John Keats if you look at this, from every stanza to the next has made the transition by connecting the first line of the stanza with the last line of the preceding stanza. So the seventh stanza ends at the word forlorn. Forlorn means alone, abandoned and uh, this is the word that then wakes him up. He says that I do imagine that this is your song that perhaps opens these doors in alone and abandoned lands and fantasy places. But this is the word that also wakes me up. I do not want to drown in your intoxication to this extent that I start to feel alone and abandoned. And he's already made that notion in one of the stanzas uh, above where he says that I do feel that when I listen to your song, I think of death too much. I even start talking to death and writing poetry for death. So forlorn is the word that wakes me up. You know, it's this word is like a bell to toll me back. You know, a bell tolls like uh, the clock tower, the bell tolls basically. It reminds you of the hour. Similarly, when I think of the word forlorn and as I write it, I am brought back to my senses and I come back to my soul self. I want to say goodbye to you. Adieu. Goodbye. You know, your, your fantasy was great, but it cannot cheat me. And it's famed to cheat. People say that if you listen to the Nightingale song, it is very intoxicating. It can drown you. It can lead you on. But I think it cannot cheat that well, this deceiving elf. Elf is again a mythological creature. So this is uh, 
Perhaps your song is famed to deceive, but I think I have come back to my senses, though I did walk along with you. So bye, bye. I know your song is beautiful, but it is also a plaintive anthem. Plaintive, which is sad and mournful. So it's very sad and mournful what you sing. And now I feel that this song is fading. And as I walk away, it's fading over the meadows, over the still stream, you know, up the hillside, and now it's buried perhaps in the next valley. So it's not perhaps the nightingale that's flying away, but the poet has woken up and it's walking and is walking away from the dark woods that he went to to listen to the nightingale. And therefore he feels that the song is now fading away from his uh, earshot and that it is perhaps now buried in the next valley. And then he imagines, was it a vision or a waking dream? You know, was I dreaming? Because Listen, he did mention a hemlock, poisonous drink. He did mention opium. He did mention wine. So he now is coming out of that intoxication and he's not very sure that uh, was it a vision in daytime? Was I sleeping or was it like a daydream? What happened to me? And this can happen when uh, one gets intoxicated with some stuff um, like wine or with something that uh, plays with your, with your capability to reason and to think and to use your memory. So he does feel, uh, was I sleeping? Was I daydreaming? But he's emerged from it now. And he says, fled is that, fled is that music. That music is gone now. And he asks himself, do I wake or do I sleep? So he's come back to his senses, though he's not very sure if he's waking or he's sleeping. It's a magnificent ode to write. The poet has expressed his feelings in a way that one, he starts by saying, I love you. What a way to sing. I have not heard anything more beautiful, more melodious, more intoxicating than this. And then he comes to a realization, you're so intoxicating that it can border on being poisonous. And then he comes to say that when I think of the word forlorn, I wake up. I'm brought back to my senses. I don't want to go down that way and lose myself. Yes, I heard your music. I enjoyed it. But I also know how to walk away from it. And he bids adieu to the bird. This is a very interesting thing in an ode to write, which like I said, is written to praise your subject, to bow down to them, to talk about or to heap praises on them in a way that you don't stop doing that. But here the poet takes a turn. Therefore, it's a very unique ode to write. And he talks about how the Nightingale's song can actually from intoxication lead you into darkness and into depression perhaps and one needs to walk away from it. So Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. If you liked this video please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon and if you want to speak to me do comment in the comment box below. I'd love to hear from you and we'll bring you new videos from Pratyansha very soon. Do keep joining us, do subscribe to the channel. I love making these videos for you. Thank you.